So I'll pass it over to, to Zach. That was the fun talk, almost. Yeah. So we've got about another half hour to go. Thanks, Tim. So those requirements, uh, certainly not all of those requirements are going to apply to all the work you do. But what's important to remember is, and as we go through the requirements for HVAC equipment, is that uh, every other trade involved in a house is having new pressure put on them, especially where they're dealing with the building envelope. They have a lot less flexibility under the new requirements in the code than they used to in terms of how you use exterior walls for running all sorts of equipment. I'm going to walk through some of the requirements for HVAC equipment uh, that put limitations on where we can run all sorts of ducts for uh, conditioned air and hot water uh, and allow that to sort of sink in for those of you in the room in terms of what that means for the installations you're doing. Um, the important takeaway here is that uh, every part of home construction is having pressure put on it to work as a system, to understand that the work you do as an HVAC contractor impacts the insulation contractor, actually starts impacting the guy who's doing drywall finishing. It impacts everyone. The home needs to run as a system, and part of that means understanding how the work you do connects to everyone else. Um, and if there's one thing you do when you leave this room tonight, it's try and talk uh, the builders you're working with into including your systems and everyone else's systems in at the start of every single project. Get it on the plans so that everyone can say, okay, here's what I have to do and here's how I'm going to meet the requirements and everyone can connect the dots because it is near impossible to comply with 936 after the fact. That might have been possible under previous iterations of the code. It really is incredibly difficult now to uh, sort out compliance with 936 at the end of a project. I'm going to walk through installation requirements for ducts and equipment. A lot of this is new in, uh, in the code, but we're really talking about energy efficiency here. I'm not talking about the changes to 932 specifically, although they do relate. Uh, it's worth noting I do have a couple copies of the bulletin on 932 if some of you are interested. We're going to talk about efficiency requirements for equipment. Again, equipment that might be dealt with in 932 and 933. 936 is going to deal with where we place that equipment and what the minimum efficiency requirements are on that equipment. And I'm also going to briefly uh, touch on how the BC Building Code, which is a regulation for design and construction and occupancy of buildings, relates to the Energy Efficiency Standards Regulation from the Energy Efficiency Act, which deals with the manufacture and sale of equipment. All part of the same stream uh, until it gets into houses, but the regulations are separate. They actually have uh, different minimum requirements and understanding both is really important to make sure that you're purchasing equipment that can actually be installed in a house. Uh, because there are situations where in this province right now you can manufacture equipment that's compliant with the requirements for manufacturing, but you can't actually install it because it doesn't meet the minimum requirements of the code unless you go performance modeling path. So we'll walk through some of that. The very high level 936 is telling anyone who's running ducts or pipes that are carrying conditioned air, so heated or cooled, or hot water, that those pipes really want to be inside the house. They need to be inside the plane of insulation. And that if you're going to take any of those ducts, again, just the ones that are carrying conditioned air, uh, hot and cold air, or hot water, if you're going to take them into unconditioned crawl spaces or attics or right outside the building, you need to treat those pipes like they're still inside the building. You have to wrap them up like a baby. They need to have the same insulation as an above grade wall. We'll walk through what that insulation requirement is, but it's not uh, the standard socks that you might put around ducts to just keep the condensation building up. They need to be fully insulated as if the wall was still there and as if they were still inside the building. So, that, I mean, the big takeaway here is the code is saying, try not to put these ducts and pipes in unconditioned spaces because it's a terrible idea when we've got embodied energy in air and water and then we run it into spaces and just lose that into unconditioned spaces. That brings up another question uh, or issue that's come up, which is the term conditioned space, and it comes up a lot in 936. The whole principle is that all the energy that's inside the conditioned space, we want to insulate it and make sure that it stays in that conditioned space and ends up being used as intended as opposed to just uh, leaked out as heat loss or air loss out of the building. A conditioned space is a, de is a defined term in the code, and it's any space in the building uh, that is provided with any means of heat to resist the variation in temperature that happens outside. There's no minimum set point on this. The code does have minimum temperatures for certain areas of a house, but a space like an attic 
that is provided with heat as a service area has no minimum set point in terms of temperature, but it's still a conditioned space if it's provided with a means of resisting that variation in temperature that happens outside. The same of, of a garage. You can have a garage with a single baseboard heater, the smallest you can buy, installed on the wall, and that is now a conditioned space because it, it is being provided with some means of resisting the exterior temperatures. Uh, now, once you have a conditioned space under 936, you need to be fully insulated, airtight, all the requirements. What 936 is really, really telling people to do is, there's no such thing as a semi-conditioned space anymore. You're either conditioned or you are not. As soon as you're heating a space at all, you need to insulate it and make sure you're holding on to that heat appropriately. Or, you're an unconditioned space, in which case insulation isn't required and you're not providing heat. Uh, but really uh, comes into play when we're talking about ducts that are miniature conditioned spaces and need to be insulated uh, when they run into unconditioned crawl spaces like here. So that has a big impact uh, for anyone who's running ducts in exterior walls. Uh, it might be a little more clear when we go from conditioned inside the house to unconditioned and we just run through that exterior wall, but what happens when we take a detour and actually install inside the wall with our ducts. At a high level, uh, 936 is saying stop doing that. You can't install ducts anymore in exterior walls without encountering a giant headache. And we'll walk through how you could potentially do it now, but it's going to require a change. This is for ducts, again, that are carrying conditioned air or pipes that are carrying hot water. What the code uh, says is that you can't reduce the amount of insulation around those ducts uh, less than what's required in the wall. So if the wall is already at its minimum and you stick a duct in there, you've removed the insulation. And so the duct itself isn't properly insulated from the outside. And so you need to somehow find a way of getting that insulation. Uh, however that's done, whether that's furring out the walls or moving to a different kind of insulation. But there's really zero flexibility in the code now around insulation for ducts and hot water pipes. That doesn't apply, however, to uh, equipment and chases and uh, conduits that we run in exterior walls all the time that don't have embodied energy and they're not carrying hot water or heated or cooled air, like electrical panels, plumbing vent stacks, uh, exhaust ducts, things like that can be installed in exterior walls, but the code is still concerned with how well insulated that house is. We'll walk through how they do that, but uh, you can, in some instances, reduce the insulation in the exterior wall. You just have to account for it. But you can't reduce the insulation around a duct at all. There's no trade-off path allowed, uh, and there's no flexibility given for those ducts in the house. So walls have some flexibility, so long as at a high level, when you step back, you can show that the house is still uh, as insulated as it, as it should be. So you decrease the insulation behind this electrical panel to some degree, you make that up by increasing it somewhere else. And there's a trade-off path that's formal that the builder has to write out and demonstrate that the house as a system is still as well insulated as it was supposed to be. Even if one area is a little lower, they make the other areas a little higher. When it comes to ducts, that flexibility is not there. And you can't stick a duct in an exterior wall now and reduce that insulation without getting <coughs> without fully meeting the insulation requirements for that wall. Uh, and I did hear a comment somewhere in the back saying that we no longer really have interior walls based on sort of market pressure to have wide open spaces. Um, this is absolutely a conflict, conflict with that dire, desire for those wide open spaces and solutions are going to have to come from the market because uh, the regulation is, is just not flexible when it comes to those ducts. Uh, and from an energy efficiency standpoint, I think that's justified. Uh, but we're going to have to make some changes in terms of what common installation looks like. So again, we've got to treat these ducts like we're inside the plane of insulation. So, and these are round numbers, but we're looking at roughly, uh, because we're looking at effective insulation, if it was fully insulated, about R16 in climate zone 4, uh, R18 uh, will get you through in climate zone 5, 6, and 7A, and R22 in 7B and 8. Uh, around here, we're generally looking at climate zone 4 and 5. Uh, Yes. For this group, you might want to point out the city of Vancouver itself has much higher specific numbers. <coughs> so the city of Vancouver is R22 for the walls. Yeah. City of Vancouver's insulation requirements are equivalent to what's required in uh, Dawson Creek uh, in northern British Columbia, uh, to be honest. It's both equivalent with climate zone 8 when it comes to insulation. Um, 
That's not because of the BC Building Code. They've gone their own path, and it is much higher. Worth being aware of. So being in the city of Vancouver, totally different uh, ball game. Uh, as I've mentioned, you cannot reduce the wall insulation uh, without accounting for it in walls. But around ducts, you can't reduce it at all below that minimum required for wall insulations. This applies in attics, uh, in ceilings, floor assemblies. Um, it is worth noting that the requirement for that insulation around ducts, though, you only have to insulate to the requirement for above grade walls. So there are situations where you can run ducts that are carrying hot air in a floor or attic assembly on the warm side of that insulation, because if you're insulating to R40 and you're decreasing five inches of that insulation, you'll still have what's required between that duct and the unconditioned attic space, uh, what's required for above grade walls. So the, there are some ways of working it into certain assemblies, but when we get into walls, if people are already playing with the minimum, there's no flexibility left for ducts. That's really important to take away from this. Uh, also worth noting that uh, when we're talking about conditioned air, at least as I understand it, uh, HRV supply ducts, once the air has been conditioned uh, with an interior return air plan, and HRV supply uh, exhaust source ducts, so when they're drawing air from uh, a kitchen or a bathroom and bringing it to the HRV, that's conditioned air. And we actually do want to hold on to that embodied energy so that we can transfer it to the air entering the house. Those ducts need to be fully insulated. Now ducts that are actually exhaust ducts that are going directly to the outdoors, they're downstream of a fan and the next opening is outside. That energy is already lost. The insulation requirements for that are uh, really status quo. You just need to make sure that you don't have condensation building up. I think it's RSI 0.75. Uh, so those, you can get away with the sock around exhaust ducts to the outdoors. But where we're trying to hold on to the heat inside any air or water, uh, we have to do that by fully insulating those ducts. Under 932, for those that aren't familiar, all ducts inside the house need to be sealed against air leakage with appropriate tapes or mastics or sealants. That's also the case outside the plane of insulation as well. Uh, makes a ton of sense outside the plane of insulation and a lot of sense inside the building. Uh, so 936 is where it talks about what you do once you get those ducts outside, that you're insulating them and you're sealing them. 932 is where it tells you as an installation requirement inside the house for ventilation systems that those ducts all need to be sealed inside the house. So similar requirements, two separate parts of the code, both apply. Um, and as I hope I've made clear, there are no trade-offs available for the insulation around ducts. Uh, except for one. Uh, if you have <laughs> I wrote it because I get so clear. But there is actually one exception. Uh, for It's primarily aimed at manufactured houses. They're really limited in terms of how tall they can build their units. And so relaxation was put in that for rectangular ducts on the bottom side of a floor assembly, the insulation on the bottom side of that duct can be reduced somewhat if you make it up on the sides. It's a really obscure uh, relaxation. It might apply in garages where you've got an unconditioned garage and conditioned space above and maybe you get a little more ceiling height, but it's aimed at manufactured buildings so that they can fit under bridges as they're transporting them down the highway. So, but uh, you can pretend it didn't exist and you'd always comply with the code. So what we're going to see is an attempt to really uh, make sure that ducks are running in conditioned spaces. Here we've got a situation where we're likely looking at at least a R28 in a cathedral ceiling potentially, maybe but not by definition, but we're making a conditioned cavity uh, above the living area so that we can run our ducts without worrying about how we're going to insulate them properly. We insulate that whole space uh, and make sure that it's warm enough and then we're able to run our ducts with uh, limited additional insulation. Uh, certainly the, it's up to the market in terms of what solutions you find to meet these constraints, but they're pretty rigid and it's worth seeing what's going to work and a lot of that may deal with uh, communicating with the other trades involved in the design and build of the house, making sure everyone's got enough space, and making sure everyone's finding the most cost-effective solutions for all the trades. Now, for hot water, that's the requirements for ducts uh, and for hot water pipes. There are additional requirements for hot water pipes. The first two meters in and out of any hot water storage tank uh, or heating vessel for hot water need to be insulated with 12 millimeters of insulation fairly standard uh, uh, yeah, pipe wrap, um, but when the pipes are going in and going out, that's potentially creating a thermal bridge. We want to make sure that's mitigated by insulating uh, those pipes. Hot water recirculation systems need to be completely insulated where they're exposed to the air. 
Um, again, we're trying to get hot water to different points in the house. We want to insulate those pipes so that it actually is hot by the time it gets there. The code now requires that as a bare minimum. Those are the requirements. So that's the end of the requirements for ducts carrying heated and cooled air and hot water pipes. Now for all other items related to those ducts uh, that don't, I guess, plumbing vent stacks, uh, exhaust ducts, electrical wires, any sort of conduits, all the things we do put in the exterior walls that don't have any embodied energy, um, the concern now is no longer on the thermal performance of that, of that uh, piece of equipment, it's on the walls themselves. So at a high level, the code is saying you shouldn't reduce the amount of insulation in the wall below the minimum required anywhere. But if you do, you have to do a formal trade-off calculation. So it is doable, like this illustration here, where they didn't quite meet the requirements for above grade walls at that area behind the electrical panel, but they can formally trade that off. And there's some pretty clear rules around how that's done. Uh, but if you're creating a situation as a, as a uh, sub-trade in a home build where you're causing a reduction in the amount of insulation or available room for insulation, someone's going to have to trade that off. That's going to have to be calculated. And if they don't have anywhere else to make that up, that's going to cause some big headaches. Again, communication at the outset, making sure everyone's got the room required to run all their equipment um, without impacting other trades negatively is crucial to making this go smoothly. Um, so at a high level, we're trying to minimize the amount of uh, reductions in insulation in the exterior walls, but it can be done, but it needs to be formally traded off. Equipment location. Again, here we're still talking about installation. All HVAC equipment, and this is different uh, than service hot water heating for whatever reason. HVAC equipment has to be inside the plane of insulation. So we're talking about inside the house. Not in unconditioned crawl spaces, not in unconditioned attics. Equipment, unless it's specifically designed to be installed outdoors, and of course there's equipment that is, uh, but unless it's specifically designed to be outdoors, it needs to be inside the house, in the warm part of the house. Uh, inside the plane of insulation. For hot water tanks, they use slightly different language, I believe, so that you can have a conditioned garage and have a hot water tank in a conditioned garage, because it says hot water tanks need to be in conditioned space. I believe, although I see some head shaking from those who have uh, been at this longer than myself, um, if you have a conditioned garage, so it's heated and fully insulated, that meets the requirements for hot water tanks. Certainly not for HVAC equipment, but for hot water tanks. Uh, I'm going to add here, related directly to this, because in 936, it explicitly states that a garage is considered as outside space. <clears throat> for the purpose of insulation, it is. And for, for insulation, so, which is, and the intent of the drafting the HVAC section of 936 was to make to keep the boilers and the furnaces out of the garage and into the house. That's part of the reason why the garage was behind as outdoor space. Even if it's going to be insulated and heated, it's still outdoor space as far as this stuff is concerned. I know that there's issues with the island where some different interpretations are going. In terms of the direction things are going, I mean, my interpretation of it, HVAC equipment, pretty clear, absolutely, doesn't belong in a garage. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, uh, not to put it in a garage. I, there might be an argument for getting hot water tanks in certain garages under certain conditions, uh, but that's subject to all sorts of feedback from the public uh, that I'm eager to hear and happy to take. Uh, but generally speaking, get all the equipment inside, like the ducts, if, it's, if you're trying to produce heat, uh, with an equipment and send that somewhere in the house, you need to do that in a warm space. Uh, this is not news to those that we presented to in Prince George, but a big change in the lower mainland and southern Vancouver Island. Equipment efficiency. Uh, so again, there's a long uh, checklist in the code, minimum efficiency required for HVAC equipment and service hot water heating equipment. Uh, I've got a copy of 936 if you don't have one and you'd like to glance at that. Uh, there's also a bulletin that the Building and Safety Standards branch has put out with the uh, uh, energy efficiency folks in another part of the BC government um, that reprints this table. So again, if you're in the industry and you just want to know what the minimum efficiency requirements are for equipment, you're a manufacturer, supplier, that's available, it's free, uh, it's out there. It's worth noting that it is only applicable to the prescriptive path uh, for builders as a minimum requirement. If a builder goes through the performance modeling path, they can choose, potentially, 
any system they want, they just need to demonstrate how efficient that is. So someone could, hypothetically, install equipment that doesn't meet the minimum efficiency requirements in the prescriptive path, uh, but they need to account for that decreased performance in the performance modeling path, and maybe they increase their insulation. They're really set on a particular uh, piece of heating equipment that isn't as efficient as the new minimum requirements. Uh, they can do that by making sure that the house as a system still works just as good as the minimum requirements of the code. That might not be a choice that every uh, builder or designer takes, but it is an option. There's a lot of flexibility so long as in the end you account for any gains and losses and you make sure that you meet the equivalent uh, of the prescriptive path in terms of minimum performance. For equipment efficiency, again, the prescriptive path, worth noting there are no trade-offs permitted. There's no flexibility. It's a list. That's the minimum requirement. This is the least you can legally uh, build in British Columbia. Uh, there's not further flexibility to this list, despite the fact that the Energy Efficiency Act uh, doesn't require manufacturers in all cases to build equipment uh, to this same standard. This applies to all construction, including, uh, well, anything that the building code applies to, which is renovations, replacement of equipment, with maybe a little asterisk beside that. Um, some replacement situations, particularly the, uh, in talking to industry, there are situations where the code has a minimum standard, in, for instance, for boilers. Uh, where they have to be high efficiency, but if you replace an existing mid-efficiency boiler uh, in a system designed for that boiler and you put in a high efficiency boiler, you're not going to get the efficiency that the code was actually after. And so there are situations that are likely renovation situations, not new build. Renovation situations that uh, likely require some engagement with building officials to find out where is there some flexibility so that we can meet the intent of the code, where the code is intended for new construction, or at least it's easiest to apply there. And in this renovation setting, we've got a bit of a transition between old and new. Uh, how do we manage this? The code doesn't give you a clear answer to that. Building officials have the authority to assist you through that process. Uh, I would encourage you again, communication at the outset is crucial, not just in new build. Uh, and of course, all of the requirements in the code apply whether there are permits required or not. The permitting process is really an administrative process that local governments take on at their pleasure. The building code applies to all building owners throughout the province at all times. How it's enforced uh, is a different question. So this equipment efficiency, there's a single table. I don't have it listed here. Um, it's multiple pages. It's worth being aware of if you're in the industry. It's a single table with all the minimum efficiency requirements for HVAC equipment. Uh, the same for service hot water heating. HRVs in particular, I don't have them listed here, but they do have specific uh, efficiency requirements and operational requirements listed in 936. They've got their own, well, it's not subsection, it's one below that, but they've got their own part of 936. There are also specific requirements around pools, hot tubs, and spas, uh, some HRV requirements where we've got a huge amount of hot, moist air that we're often trying to get out of the building. Uh, the building code is now dealing head on with those kinds of situations and requiring you to capture a lot of that air that's in, uh, heat that's embodied in that air that you're likely going to be exhausting because of the high moisture content. Uh, not a situation you'll encounter in every home, but worth noting, there, there are explicit requirements now that are a minimum requirement to the code. Also worth noting, natural gas and propane fireplaces, so not primary heating systems, but uh, these uh, secondary heating systems in the house that are often decorative do have minimum requirements now uh, in the code. It's not listed in that uh, table for HVAC equipment because it's not a primary heating source, but natural gas and propane fireplaces, uh, there's a standard listed that they need to comply with now, and I believe that's the same one that's in the Energy Efficiency Act. The other change is that they can no longer have a standing pilot. Uh, needs to be pilot on demand or intermittent. There are requirements for controls of our HVAC equipment. Um, thermostats need to engage the heating or cooling as required uh, when there's a variation in temperature of uh, uh, 0.5 degrees C from the set point. Um, the change set point, if someone walks into the house and uh, it's the winter and they feel like it's too hot in the house, so we're in the heating season, but the occupant feels it's too warm, if they crank down the thermostat, uh, the system needs to be designed so that, that doesn't kick in the air conditioning to get it down to that new set point. Uh, I hope that's common practice right now, not to be having your air conditioning kicking in in the middle of the winter, uh, but the code now requires that as a bare minimum, that you don't during the heating season have cooling kicking in, or during the cooling season have heating kicking in just to match the set point. 
that you let nature take its course when the occupant dramatically changes the set point. So that's at a very high level the sort of key changes to uh, installation uh, as it relates to energy efficiency and uh, minimum equipment efficiency where we're putting that equipment, the controls that are around there, uh, a lot of new requirements uh, for this industry. It is worth noting those are all the requirements in the BC Building Code which regulates design and construction and occupancy of buildings and of course the building owner is the one responsible for uh, compliance with the BC Building Code. The Energy Efficiency Standards Regulation that's uh, under the Energy Efficiency Act is a separate regulation. They're both regulations, the BC Building Code and the ES EESR, uh, and they both apply at all times, but to different people at different parts of the construction <coughs> process. The EESR applies to the manufacturing sale of certain equipment, uh, doors, windows, uh, HVAC equipment, um, and the one responsible for complying with that is the uh, manufacturer or retailer. And so they've got separate responsibilities under the EESR from the building owner who can then uh, go to market, choose whatever they want, and then needs to comply with the building code. Uh, we are making efforts to make sure that they're appropriate appropriately aligned, but the EESR can't change as quickly as the building code does, so the building code here has made a big change, and the energy efficiency standards reg uh, is in the process of changing, but that will take some time. Um, so they're not identical regulations, but both apply with equal authority uh, to different people. We have a 13-page bulletin uh, that we produced on the Building and Safety Standards Branch website. I've got a few copies here as well. If uh, anyone's interested, I think I have seven copies left. Um, it basically lists out, we've done a comparison table between the EESR and the BC Building Code requirements in terms of equipment, highlighted some equipment that have different requirements, some where the Building Code is higher, some where the EESR is higher, uh, and then we've printed out the two relevant tables from the Building Code so that you've got that all in one place, as well as sort of an explanation of how these two regulations uh, work together in a single industry, but apply somewhat differently uh, to the very same equipment. Uh, certainly gas-fired warm air furnaces, so the EESR, uh, AFUE, looking at 90%, uh, the BC Building Code, 92%. Again, we have a few different pieces of equipment. Not all of the equipment is different. We did go through them before we made uh, changes to the building code, uh, but some of the equipment is not, is not the same. Uh, same with uh, service hot water heating equipment as well. Worth going through if this applies to you. Um, I can email a copy of this. It's probably much easier for those of you trying to constrain to actually see the details on the screen. This is more just to highlight that this information is available. Uh, I've got it here if you want to glance at it this evening in an easier to read format. Uh, and I can absolutely email a copy to everyone and it's available on our website. Uh, but certainly some of these changes have a big impact to manufacturers who might be making something that complies with the regulation that applies to them, but then builders can't actually uh, purchase and install that equipment through the prescriptive path. And it's really worth being aware of how those dots connect um, because there are all sorts of situations uh, where just because you can buy it uh, doesn't mean you can install it. And just because it can be installed in a building doesn't mean that it can actually be manufactured or sold in this province. Um, and so it's, uh, it makes a lot more sense when the energy efficiency reg is higher than the building code. And so everything that you can buy is compliant with the minimum construction standard. But right now we have a situation uh, where the two aren't necessarily aligned and the building code uh, doesn't allow you to install some of the equipment that is uh, <coughs> legally manufactured and sold in the province unless you do the performance modeling path. So there is that caveat, but really worth being aware of. Resources available. Uh, we are publishing bulletins as fast as I can get them out. The branch is engaged in uh, a lot of work. Energy efficiency is just some of it, so we are working as quickly as we can to deal with the biggest fires on 936 and address those questions. Um, they're posted on the Building and Safety Standards Branch website, housing.bc.gov.ca, and then you just click on Building and Safety Standards Branch. bccodes.ca tends to get updated a little quicker than ours does, we work very closely with them, they're the publisher for the code. Um, that's probably your quickest, most up-to-date resource, certainly for their current code, um, and they publish all their bulletins and any other information that goes out. You can ask any question related to energy efficiency or anything in the code at any time to codequestion at gov.bc.ca. This goes to one of uh, five technical uh, 
uh, codes administrators, so I'm one of them, but there's four others who work in the branch, and this comes into an inbox, and we deal with the questions as quickly as we can, typically within a week, unless they require a little more research. Uh, but any question you have about the code, we talk to building officials all the time. Uh, we're there to serve you. Uh, it's your tax dollars at work. We are happy to help support you in complying with the building code, because it's not always clear, particularly with energy efficiency. That in particular is my role, dealing with the changes to 936, uh, and the part three changes for energy efficiency. So there's a dedicated person uh, specifically to answering these kinds of questions. I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I can tell you what kinds of questions we've been dealing with and try and give you the best solutions available at the time. Uh, National Research Council, all this content does come from the National Building Code. Um, and so it's worth, if you're in this industry and are concerned about uh, what direction uh, new regulations coming down the line might be going, and whether you've had an opportunity to provide input, Keep an eye on the National Research Council's website where they're dealing with these construction matters and they're drafting and putting out public reviews uh, for changes to the industry. That's where you're gonna see it. There's an opportunity for public review there. Uh, and sometimes there's an additional opportunity, there was for 936, uh, an additional opportunity within British Columbia where we do our own public review. 936 went through two separate public reviews and has been in place uh, as regulation in British Columbia for almost two years now. Uh, realize we maybe could have done a better job communicating that to everyone. Uh, that's a perennial challenge for uh, those of us in the provincial government, but um, it's out there. Uh, keep an eye on these, these websites. It is really worthwhile because uh, this is where you can see uh, impacts that will hit the industry five years from now, ten years from now. The HBO Illustrated Guide that Tim also mentioned, uh, the CWC Online Calculator, excellent resources for those dealing uh, particularly at a high level of dealing with building envelope issues, um, and certainly education through industry groups uh, like TECA and other organizations. Uh, this is essential to getting that information out that's relevant to the work you're doing. Uh, and um, we're working at the government certainly with a number of organizations to make sure they've got the answers uh, they need to make sure they can deliver, deliver accurate and timely information uh, to their members. Uh, again, it's my job to uh, deal with these issues. Whether or not I can provide answers for all of them is a separate issue, but um, as a compliance advisor for energy, you can call me, you can email me, or you can send it to codequestion at gov.bc.ca, and we've got Tim Rice's email as well uh, at the City of North Vancouver. Uh, happy to take any questions, but thanks very much for your patience. Can I just add, because there's a lot of people here working in the City of Vancouver, Vancouver has basically adopted pretty much the same, but some of the specifics are tweaked differently. And you should be aware that with the higher R values, if you're probably going to see a lot of continuous installation across the outside, which is going to mean you have to review how you're handling your approach on outside and exterior walls and how that's detailed. You can't just slap it onto the sheet if there's insulation going on on the outside. The other thing is that they have is uh, a nose side wall venting of gas boilers or furnaces. Yeah. Um, basically, they have to go front or back or to the floor. So that's while the gas will allows you to side wall vent, <coughs> that's going to have an impact for some. And some of those are going to be the city of
the uh, ceiling of the ductwork in conditioned spaces. Um, are there any rules as to how that's done? Are any you know, uh, specifications that's now done? Some guys think that taking the pipe joints is sealing ductwork. I look at it beyond that. But. Uh, in 932, which is what you're talking about, sealing uh, ductwork inside the house, yeah. uh, we have laid out explicit requirements for what materials can be used for that. We borrowed the language largely from 936 in terms of the appropriate materials. Um, fabric back duct tape is not listed there uh, as an appropriate material. It's explicitly material. excluded at 936. Yeah. <laughs> I think it may be uh, the same as well in 932, but um, do you mean beyond that in terms of sealing? Uh, yeah, not even the, um, the material necessarily, although that's a, a big part of it, but also what needs to be sealed. There's album cords, there's duct joints, there's drive cleats, S cleats, uh, there's takeoff connections. I mean, there's so many leakage points. Uh, the, the pipe joints themselves are probably 1% of the whole system. The code, to be fair, probably just has language something along the lines of all joints, you know, longitudinal or otherwise, need to be sealed. Um, that's where uh, talking to those in your industry is probably a better solution than looking in the code for that kind of solution. That's really starting to get into best practice. The fact that we're explicitly requiring sealing inside the building envelope at all is a big step for the code. Um, and then it goes further as to what would the inspector be looking for. Because again, what, what I might have to want somebody else might. Are the inspectors looking for something or are they just, I don't know, looking for a, a material that looks like foil tape or, or a water-based sealer or something like that in certain spots and saying that's good enough? I mean, the answer to what a building official is looking at has two answers. One is they have the authority to enforce the code as it's written. Uh, but it also goes back to communicate with the building official at the beginning. What are you familiar with? Here's what I'm planning on doing. Do we both agree that this is what the code is asking for and it complies with it in this situation? Uh, the code can only provide some answers. Uh, I would really, really suggest touching base with building officials on any of these changes before you do something that is now a new requirement. Even if it's been common practice for you before, touch base with building officials and make sure everyone's on the same page because <coughs> All this is new to them as well, um, and so that's, that's what I was going to say. As, as much as, as the building official comes on site and says, We're, "We know everything. Don't worry about it," uh, we don't, and we don't like to admit that publicly. But I will on their behalf. And as, as much as, as you guys are struggling with this, and this is new, and there's stuff that makes total sense, and stuff that's kind of in the gray area, it's definitely the same thing for us. And especially on a case by case, jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis, it's, it's more communication is better. If we can all learn together, it, it just makes it so much easier. Yes. My question is more about uh, energy efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> energy efficiency requirements uh, for the uh, split air conditioning systems and heat pumps. And I think we got this conversation once or twice before. I hope we can come up with a different answer. Uh, where the requirement is asking for uh, 14 and a half sear and 11.5 EGR. That's not going to change. It's not a more. It's absolutely a man. Yeah, the code, uh, the question is there are uh, two efficiency uh, metrics for the split heat pumps, uh, and it's the SEER rating and the ER rating, and in the code it is an AND, both uh, have to be complied with, as it's written right now. Um, I, yeah, that's, uh, just, just to be clear that there's some things that Zach can own that, that, that he physically wrote or worked with the Tekka folks and wrote, and there's some things that Zach can't really own that it wasn't really his fault. So the, the element that you're <laughs> speaking about, the, the 936 is, it is a national document. It was, it was created by the standing committees of the, of the Canadian Code Council. At the, the national level, it is being applied largely unchanged in the provinces across Canada slowly as they roll it out. We are one of the first, so we're the first to walk off the cliff. But um, it, it, it is not Zach's fault on that stuff. So you can definitely let him know and, 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 and let him know what the challenges are. That's where he's also saying watch the NRC website because those are the people that have the authority to, to make those changes. Everything takes time, unfortunately. 932 though, that's actually totally your guys' fault, as I understand it. And, and Zach helped out with that mostly. But So it, it, there's an ownership issue on this one that we can we can say we'd love to be able to fix it right away, but you know he, he has to be the one to wear it, unfortunately, for you. Just as an extension of that, those energy efficiency requirements that apply to, to existing buildings? Uh, no. no. They, they, 
uh, the building code applies to any new work that's being done. Okay. It does not apply retroactively to existing buildings or situations. Now, uh, a new house, pretty clear, all the new house needs to meet the new requirements of the code. In an existing house where you're replacing certain parts and you're repairing little bits and you're adding on a new piece, uh, the new parts need to fit, meet the requirements of the new code. The old parts are left alone because you're not doing work on them. Where there's that interface, and particularly something like HVAC, where we have a house system, and maybe we're replacing one, you know, the equipment that drives that system, but the ductwork doesn't really fit with the new equipment, that's where uh, that, that discussion needs to be had because the code uh, isn't the best tool available for navigating that situation. I don't have an easy answer for you because the code doesn't in that situation. It, it just doesn't. Yes? So on, on accident borders, if it's a retrofit, they can be installed or they can't be installed? Technically, the code uh, has a minimum requirement for what can be installed. Um, and so if you're in it, the code applies to the replacement of equipment. And so if you're taking something out and you're putting in new equipment, that new equipment needs to meet the requirements of the code. But what I'm saying is in practice, and certainly, you know, having heard some feedback from those of you in the room, there are situations where the code sets a minimum standard that if you actually followed, you wouldn't achieve what the code is trying to achieve in terms of efficiency. There's not a lot of those situations, but they do exist, and boilers are one that's been brought to our attention. Uh, and all I can say is, right now, I mean, the change to 936 is not a proposal. It's in the code. It's written, and the next opportunity to change that takes some time, and between now and then, uh, Identify those issues, communicate them to us, as has been done formally and informally, and we appreciate that. Uh, and all I can suggest is where the intent of the code goes a different direction than what the code says in a particular situation, that discussion with the building official. Yeah. So one of the questions, so who's going to enforce that question? Are you pulling a permit or no? Yeah, Then it would be the, the local authority that would, be, that would be helping you through that process. Well, sort of, is that a building permit or a gas permit? <laughs> oh, then it depends on the jurisdiction yeah. as well. If it's if it's BC Safety or if it's if it's the local authority, then yeah. We are working. Uh, I mean, discussions with the BC Safety Authority, their electrical and their gas sides, to uh, make sure that as part of their tech talks and as part of their further education, that they're aware of the building code requirements. But they don't enforce the building code except in situations where you have municipalities that enforce uh, gas, electrical, and building. But the BC Safety Authority does not. They don't enforce the building code. Um, they, they don't. I, uh, it's a, that one where it is. A similar example, though, to can you can you replace like with like? Uh, we've had an uh, ongoing problem with uh, heritage buildings, and you, you uh, everyone loves to keep that beautiful old heritage building, and they, they do a major upgrade to it, and they all of a sudden throw at the, the new construction requirements at the building envelope. They throw on a nice tight vapor barrier on one side, air barrier on the other. And uh, within a year, that building's rotted out and it's coming down because the building itself, as a heritage building, was constantly air drying its structure and leaking out all sorts of heat, and that's what allowed it to exist for so long in, in our rainforest environment. So, we're, we're at least the two jurisdictions that I've worked at, we've looked at heritage with a very soft stick and said, look, if it was working before, we've got to really think about what we're going to do in terms of applying the new construction, the new code requirements to it. And the building code does give us that flexibility with a motherhood statement at the beginning that says you have to think about what you're doing for, for, for retrofit. So again, it's a bit of a discussion piece, a bit of a one by a, a one by, a, a, a case by case basis. But I can I can see an argument for, for not necessarily going away from like to like on that. Bit of a question. Uh, as a supplier in my warehouses, I have ten million dollars worth of product that doesn't fly. What do I do with it? I would encourage people to find code compliant ways of installing that equipment. Atmospheric I mean, product that's 80% efficient. What do you do with it? Uh, we don't want to make it a boat anymore. No. no. So what do you do with it? I mean, I don't have an answer for that. No. I, I can well, tell you what the building code says but, and it's said for a number of years. But. When, you, when, you dump a, when you dump a code, right, with people that have got millions and millions of dollars worth of product, you want to buy it? There's, I, there's no question. There's absolutely an impact on industry. And from How does the government take so, care of those people? So the one thing and that, not take a bath and put a guy out of this. Yeah. The one thing that Zach won't say, because um, he's far too polite to, is that this was publicized almost 18 months ago on the BC Code's website. 
as saying this is what's coming in 936 with the full installation tables there for, for this express purpose. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but, but they, they, as he says, communication is always the hardest to get that out, that, that, last, that last mile to get it out to folks like yourselves. Um, but it is something that, that was out there for a long time. Us as building officials, we're still on our tails as well. And the, 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 the best suggestion might be finding a municipality, or sorry, a province that hasn't adopted 936 yet and see if you can use them that way. But it, this, this, is, this is the reality that we work in now. Yes, the question is whether uh, ventilation and the requirements for makeup air have changed a bit in the code. Uh, and the answer is no, they've changed a lot. Uh, is, uh, we have rewritten, uh, I shouldn't say we, really, uh, uh, TECA, uh, has, and David Hill in particular, has assisted enormously in rewriting 932 to make sure that we have now adequate ventilation as a minimum standard in the code. Uh, no longer, you can't, you can't do exhaust-only ventilation systems uh, in the BC building code anymore because, frankly, that's not really a system. We were just assuming that enough air was leaking in through different parts of the house uh, that you'd get fresh air in the house somehow, and that having that bathroom fan running uh, exhausting was completing that system. 936 has forced us to plug all those holes in our air barrier and make sure it's tight, uh, and so 932 has had to change to put some lungs on that house. Common practice for a lot of folks, uh, certainly an HRV does that job uh, entirely, but uh, the 932 has changed, so I've got a bulletin that outlines those changes. The actual code content for 936 and 932 is available online for free, whether you own a copy of the code or an online subscription or not. Uh, if you're having difficulty finding those, please email me. I'm happy to send you a PDF of those, uh, that new code wording so that you can see exactly what the code says. Um, because there are times when an illustrated guide isn't as exact as the code is for a particular situation. It's worth having both at hand. There's one question on heating that might be in the Tim Bergman's tongue here. The standard house in Surrey has a counterflow furnace accessible from a pair of bifold or, or insulated doors from a garage. It's over a heated crawl space, so technically that furnace is inside the house, and yet it's accessible from a pair of insulated or thin filled doors from the garage. Is that question come up before? And is there a standard answer to whether that's acceptable that we continue that practice? You need to, uh, you could hypothetically install your HVAC equipment in a part of the garage so long as you walled that off and separated that little uh, furnace room cabinet from the rest of the garage as if that's an exterior wall. So uh, exterior grade doors, uh, full insulation around those walls, uh, treating the garage, whether it's conditioned or not, as unconditioned space uh, for that insulation. So the short answer is yes, someone could do that, but they need to really make sure that they got all of the requirements in 936 right uh, to be able to do that. Just treat the mechanical room as, as an outside wall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can do that. I mean, what you're doing is you're just making your garage smaller uh, and increasing the amount of effectively more space. I mean, if it was in the garage, all the time, well, not on the water side. Or to forge rounds. So one thing I would caution on that, though, if you start adding the end of an interior conditioned space to your garage, from a planning perspective, you might be adding to the floor space of the building, and then you might have issues from that point of view. So. Again, if you're going to do that, put it on the plans at the beginning so that you don't get caught uh, later on trying to add a, a room to a house. The same issue is coming up in some jurisdictions with attic spaces as well um, that maybe before were or weren't insulated, but now they're conditioned attic spaces that are nice, big, great mechanical rooms. An uh, excellent space to put all this equipment in a warm, uh, insulated space, but now all of a sudden it's interior living space, uh, and that has a real impact on the general contractor in that project. Is that a contradiction? Where, 
The square footage limit is a land use requirement. So absolutely, talk to local governments about changing their bylaws and say, look, we're actually trying to do something good in terms of energy efficiency. Don't punish us. So for in term, but that's a land use bylaw issue. That's not a building code issue. So in lockstep with that, in, in the city of North Vancouver, and I know that Squamish <coughs> has the same, we brought in a, a 100 square foot FSR exempt mechanical room that you can use for all of your stuff. And that is a bonus to beyond what the maximum house you're allowed to build. And that's your <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it started at 50 and got to 100, but so you can know that the city of North Van is a separate room, you can put all your equipment in there, uh, and that also allows for, for the tanks, if you're pre-piping for solar hot water, that gives you your extra interior space for that, so that, that, that costs you nothing other than the concrete to build it. But uh, by all means, let, let's get other municipalities to do the same thing. I think the city of Burnaby is off the as well. City of Burnaby, yeah. I don't think they've done it yet, but they thought we're, we're better at the city of North End, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they haven't done it yet. Yeah. <laughs>
Got all the questions so far? Anything else? Going once, going twice. If anyone wants a copy of those bulletins, there's a few of those left, or at least a glance at them, or the code, or wants to go into any detail, put it in the stuff. Uh, I'm here.